great to be with you this morning. I just had a panic there. Suri asked me what I wanted, so I, <laughs> help, I need help. Um, it's great to be here. Happy Mother's Day. I'm so glad that I get to spend it with all of you. It's a great time. I wish my mom a happy Mother's Day as well. And uh, they asked me, you know what I realize is that the last five Mother's Days, um, I've spoke, actually four out of five of them I've been speaking. I only have one Mother's Day talk. It's five ways you can be a better mom. And uh, no, obviously I didn't speak that. I wouldn't be here today. <laughs> you know, they make good Father's Day talks though. Everyone's okay with it then. I just noticed that. Um, so... They told me to just stick with Luke, stick with Luke. So we're going to stick with a sermon series that we're going through that Pastor Dan's been taking. It's the gospel for outsiders based on the book of Luke. And I'm excited to be able to uh, join in the series along with Dan. And we're going to look at at chapter 7 together today. And Dan cheated. Last week he picked all the best parts out of chapter (laughs) 7. And he left me with today. So you'll get it later um, for sure. So we're going to look at that. It's not the best Mother's Day talk I could probably bring, but the best part is it's God's Word and it's truth for us. And I believe that if we allow God to speak to us through it, that lives can be changed because of it. So let's just pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you today for your Word. I thank you for providing us an insight into who you are and that we can know today that you are a good God. We can know today that we are loved. And despite what we face, despite our circumstances today, we can run to you and you can be there for us. And so we thank you for all you've done today. We come in thanksgiving and we bring the realities of our lives before you today. And we ask you to speak into them through your word. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. I'm just going to read to you the passage that we're going to look at. If you want to turn there, it's in Luke chapter 7. I'm not going to put it on the PowerPoint yet. I'll put it up a little bit later as we look into it. Luke chapter 7, verse 18, it says, The disciples of John the Baptist told John about everything he was doing. So John called for two of his disciples, and he sent them to go to the Lord to ask him a question. Are you the Messiah that we have been expecting? Or should we keep looking for someone else? So John's disciples, they went and they found Jesus, and they said to him, John the Baptist sent us to ask you a question. Are you the Messiah we've been expecting? Or should we just keep looking for someone else? So at that very time, Jesus cured many people of their diseases, their illnesses, and evil spirits, and restored sight to the many who were blind there. And then he told John's disciples, go back to John and tell him what you've seen and what you've heard. The blind see, the lame are walking, the lepers are cured, the deaf hear, and the dead are raised to life. And the good news is being preached to the poor. And tell them, tell them this also. God blesses those who do not turn away because of me. In the meantime, we've been looking at the Gospel of Luke, and one thing that that Luke wants us to know for absolute certainty as we read his account of Jesus' life is that Jesus has all authority. He has all knowledge. He has all power. Anything and everything is at his fingertips if he so wishes. There's nothing withheld from him, and he, he proves it through, through evidence of being able to actually impact nature around him. He can, he can still the waves. He can calm the winds. He can turn water into wine. The physical realm has, has nothing on him. He can heal the blind. He can make lame people walk again. He can actually overcome the power of death. And even last week when Dan was preaching, he talked about the story of when Jesus saw the dead boy being paraded through town on the way to being buried. He had compassion on the widow, went up to the casket and touched the boy and raised him to life. Death is under his authority under his control and under his power. No demonic spirit 
can stand up against them. Anytime there was something that no one else could deal with, Jesus, by his very word, could deal with it. In fact, and even in the other story that we looked at in chapter 7, is even when someone came from a distance and said, my servant is sick, but you don't even need to come and see her. If you just say that she's healed, she'll be healed. You don't even have to be there, Jesus. I believe that you have that authority. Jesus said, you're right. And he went back home and she was healed. Luke wants us to know that there is nothing that takes place that is beyond the authority and the power and the influence that Jesus can have. Jesus is Lord. And yet, in the meantime, in the meantime, we sit here reading about what Jesus is capable of doing, what he's doing, and in the meantime, we watch the news. In the meantime, we see what's going on around the world. We see the persecution of the church and the Christians being slaughtered and being beheaded. In the meantime, we see the devastation of earthquakes. In the meantime, we see global concerns all over the place. We see the economy falling. We see people losing houses. We see the fires in Fort McMurray. We see how nature can take everything away. In the meantime, we read in God's word that there is nothing outside of his power in control. And yet you and I will experience something in the meantime. Some of you are here with a broken marriage. Some of you are here with illness, with cancer. Some of you are lame. Some of you are losing sight. Some of you have had people that you love die and in all this you have been praying you've been asking for him to step in and yet nothing is changing what do we do in the meantime here comes a story right in the midst of all this amazing things it says that when the disciples of John the Baptist, they told about everything that Jesus was doing. Now, now, John was in prison because he was proclaiming the gospel. He was proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. The kingdom was coming, that people need to repent from their sins, that they need to stop. And he was fearless, and he preached against Herod and how Herod was... Um, sexually active with his brother's wife and he preached against it and this was an abomination and of course you do that too much in that time and they put John in prison and chained him to a wall to stop him because he was committed to the truth. And so his disciples that followed John that were part of his community, part of his tribe, they, they cared for him because in prison there you didn't get fed. People had to come. If you didn't have people who cared enough about you, you were in trouble. And so they would bring him food and they'd bring him water and they would bring him stories. You wouldn't believe what Jesus is doing. It's incredible. He's healing people. He's raising people back from the dead. He is changing everything. He is amazing. And in the midst of that, of hearing that day after day after day, John finally sends the disciples to go to Jesus and say, I need to know something. Are you the one that I have been preaching about my entire life or not? Are you the one who sets people free? Are you the one that is in control of the authorities around me? Are you the one that actually can deal with anything? Are you it? Or am I going to look for someone else? It's a great question. We would expect seekers to ask that question. I've had to ask that question in my life. In the meantime, and you've probably been in the meantime, and if if you haven't, you will be. Because as we read about what Jesus is capable of, as we understand what the gospel says, and we understand that God is in control, and that God is all-powerful, eventually you will hit a meantime place in your life where you have to look and say, okay, so then why? 
Why am I stuck? Why am I here? Why am I where I shouldn't be? Why am I suffering? Why am I going through this trial? Why aren't you stepping in? Why am I here if you are really the one? We will always find our place eventually in the meantime where we ask that question. And John gives us permission that it's okay. It's a question we should wrestle with. We really should. Is he the one? But for John, there's something very strange about this question. If you know the story of John, if you understand the history of John, and Luke, more than any other writer of the gospel, more than any other account, make sure that we understand where John came from. And we have our Christmas story when it comes to Luke. And, and we, we did, as we did in this series, we always start with the birth of Jesus and the miraculous birth of Jesus and the angels coming and all that. But actually, Luke starts with a different miraculous conception. Luke starts by telling us that there was another baby that was being born that was a gift from God, that was a special, a special blessing of God. And it, he gives a, a baby to a couple that were really old. <laughs> and they could not not have kids. And he comes to them, and these were, these were God-fearing people. It was Zachariah and Elizabeth, and they wanted a child, but now they were so long past childbearing, but they, God comes to them, the angel of the Lord comes and says, I am going to give you a child. You're going to call him John. And he's going to tell everyone that Jesus is the one. His whole existence, his whole reason for being will simply to be to proclaim that Jesus is the Lamb of God, he is the Messiah, he is the King of kings and Lord of lords. That is why he exists. I'm going to give him to you. It's an amazing story. In fact, we don't read about it often, but the conception of, of Jesus and Mary was so miraculous, of course, it was a divine intervention of God, conceived of God, yet that God said, to prove to you what I'm doing inside of you is from me. I want you to go visit your relative, Elizabeth. And when you see her age and you see her having a kid, it will be witness to the fact that what I'm doing in you is also a miracle. That's how amazing it was. God said, go check out Elizabeth. You won't believe what I'm doing for them. And when you see it, you will believe as well. And so Luke gives us the account. She goes, and she, Mary goes to find Elizabeth. And this is what happens when Mary finally meets Elizabeth and walks in the room, and both of them are pregnant. Mary walks in, and Luke records that John, the baby inside of Mary, leaps with joy. There he is. He's in the room. He's the one. That's why I exist. That's why I'm, I'm conceived. That's why I'm born. To tell everyone he, he's the one. He's not going, are you the one? Or is, I wait for someone else. He's, he's there. <laughs> and then later on, we see the whole, the whole purpose. John goes out into the desert and, and spends his entire ministry preparing the way for Jesus. And it says in John, when Jesus finally shows up on the scene and um, when Jesus shows up, John had never seen him before, but all of a sudden, John sees him coming, and he is aware, and he proclaims in front of everybody, there he is! This is the guy I've been preaching my entire life about. He is the Messiah. He is the Lamb of God. He is the one that takes away the sins of the world. He is the one. And then he even explains to everybody how he knows. He said, God told me that I would see the Holy Spirit descending on him like a dove. And that's what I saw. And John was at his baptism when he baptized him. And he heard an audible voice of the Father saying, this is my son. He's the one. He saw it. He heard it. He knew it. And yet here he is. In the meantime, hearing what Jesus is capable of. And it comes inside of him. 
I need to know. Does Jesus know where I am? Does he understand what I'm going through? How could he be the one? I mean, if he wanted to, he could overthrow the government tomorrow. I mean, I'd be a free man. If he wanted to, he would just speak words and I would be out of here. So he sends his disciples. And Jesus does all these miracles in front of his disciples all over again. And he says, go back to John and tell him what you've seen and tell him what you've heard. The blind see, the lame walk, those with leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised to life, and the good news is being preached to the poor. He's talking, he's talking about the prophet Isaiah and how Isaiah prophesied these would be the signs to know that he is the one. And so he says, tell them that you're seeing it fulfilled. Tell them you're seeing the prophecies are coming about. Go and tell them. And then he adds a sentence just for John, and I'll say for us today as well. He says, and one more thing. Tell them this. Tell them that God blesses those who do not fall away because of me. In the way that we understand Christian faith today in the church, I think that phrase gets confused. And I think we need to understand what Jesus is saying. Is he saying, wait a minute, because I'm doing all these amazing miracles, John, you're going to be tempted not to believe in me. I mean, maybe you're sitting there thinking, you know what, if one more blind person starts to see around here, I'm out of here. I just give up. I can't handle this. You know, one more dead person gets out, and that's it. Jesus, I, is Jesus saying, you know what, there's, there's, a, there's a chance here that if I do too many miracles for people, that you're just not going to believe in me anymore. Or perhaps is Jesus saying to John, you're right. I have all authority. I have all power. Everything is at my command. I see you. I understand your predicament. I am the one who can. And I'm also the one who doesn't. And you will be blessed if you persevere the fact that I'm not rescuing you from this place. We don't know how John received that message. We don't get the rest of the story because quickly after that, he was beheaded and executed and he became the first of many, many followers of Jesus Christ who would have to go through in the meantime. A time in which they experienced all kinds of atrocities in their life. But something Something in their understanding about their faith made their faith stronger and grow more through the mean times. And we need to understand it and we need to look at that today. We need to understand because sometimes when we see devastation, when we think that, that God can't possibly understand or know what's going on, our faith begins to crumble. We escape, we want to run away, we quit. We say, God, if you allow this, if you allow people to mock me, if you allow persecution, if you allow this death, if you allow this sickness, and if you don't answer this prayer, then I don't have any faith. That is not the faith of the early church, the foundation of why we're here today, actually. It worries me when you look at that. And so we think of all kinds of crazy things. And we, you know, you look on the social media when stuff happens and they say, you know, what's going on in Fort McMurray? Well, let's, it must be karma or something. You know, I mean, they, I don't know. There's got to be a reason behind this. And so we, we as Christians, we're no better. We, we almost don't understand it. We, we sit there and we think, what is God doing? 
But you need to know as you learn from this story a couple very important things. Jesus is not powerless to intervene. He can intervene. Jesus is not apathetic. In other words, he cares what is happening. And Jesus is not angry. But yes, nothing happens outside of his power and authority and control. How do we deal with this? How do we handle it when we're in the meantime, when God isn't showing up, when God's not doing what we want him to do, when we expect him to do something, we expect him to rescue us, we expect him to save us, we expect him to parachute us out of here? Does our faith crumble or does our faith grow stronger? Will we receive the blessing of God because we persevere through it or will we fall apart because of it? In these times, in the meantime, in your life, whatever you are facing, you begin to discover what your faith actually is resting on. When everything else outside of control gets wiped away, You have to face this question. Is Jesus still the one? Or am I going the wrong way? It's a question we face. It's a question we need to be able to answer. And in this passage, we understand Because Jesus goes on and he talks about John and he brags about John, how pleased he is with John and no one was greater than John before him. And and he talks about his ministry and how effective his ministry was. Jesus is bragging up John and leaving him in prison. It's hard on our heads, but this is what we have to understand, that faith is not, cannot rest upon this tangible world around us that the faith of the early believers was actually based on trusting God in the midst of circumstances that they could not control that is how faith is built and throughout all of scripture God has constantly longed for a people a people that would follow him and have strong faith despite what was going on around them And every time his people would get blessed, every time his people would have blessing poured out on them, they would forget him. And they would be self-made people and they would turn away and they would do their own thing. And so God has to shake them up and he has to bring them back down to the foundation so they can rest and trust in him. Throughout all of scripture, this is what our faith is based on. That we would trust him in the midst of circumstances that are outside of our control. Whenever something is happening around the world that seems like it's out of control, I want you to know something. God is at work. He's not powerless. It's not that he doesn't care. It's that God does his best work in the midst of adversity with his people. Any of you would have to know that in your life, you grow stronger in your faith when you have to depend on him alone. Blessing never brings about strong faith. And for some reason, our faith is precious to God. He wants a people that are strong in their faith. Miracles don't bring about strong faith. They don't. Miracles in Scripture, as I can see, as I've been reading and studying, and I'm sure there's exception to the rule, but in generally, miracles in Scripture take place to actually stamp God's authority and proof of what he's trying to do in the world. In other words, they announce his kingdom is here. So Jesus would send his disciples out and he would say, Preach the coming of the kingdom and heal the sick so that the sick would recognize who he was and believe the message. Message and miracles always go together. God wants to do a miracle. God wants to do these things, but it's for his glory. It's for his message that other people would know the kingdom of God is here.
Jesus was okay with John the Baptist going to his death because Jesus actually has authority over his death. And he has promised that his followers, those that trust in him, those that believe in him, will not die, will not perish, but live forever. The greatest miracle that Jesus can do in any of our lives today is the miracle of when we enter into a relationship with him, when we trust in him and what he has done, when we trust in what he did on the cross for us, the miracle is that we have everlasting life. We have moved from death into light. We are invincible. If you are new to church today, <laughs> this might be a little odd. Because so many people use Christianity to try to make their life better. In other words, they use the teachings of the Scripture in hopes that they can withdraw, extract, abuse Scripture so that God will make their life better and more successful. The truth is, all of Scripture is founded on the fact that the gospel is we have eternal life and no matter what we face, we have received the greatest miracle ever. In other words, any other miracle that Jesus will ever do in your life is only temporary and evidence of what he's already done in you. It's evidence in, I have yet to meet the dead people that Jesus raised still walking around. They died. Again. Hopefully not in persecution, because they might have thought, oh great. Everyone that was ever healed still had to face death. Their healing was witness of the power of Jesus Christ. It was a witness, it was a message of the true healing that Jesus wants to do in us. When we long and we settle for a lesser miracle, we fail to give thanks and understand truly where our hope is found. We are not to mourn like the rest of the world. We are not to go through adversity like the rest of the world. We can give thanks in the midst of all things. We have to be careful in the West because we have been so blessed. We get convinced that that is the evidence of God's blessing. We, crazy things. I mean, you, I know, forgive me if, it's, if you're one of them that's done it, but I mean, when you see hashtag blessed now, it's because someone's on the beach in Mexico or Tahiti or something, or blessed on the back of the license plate of a BMW, or blessed because everything went really good this week. But in scripture, you need to know that in Jesus' teaching, that's not actually what he says is Blessed. Blessed are when people recognize that he is their only hope. Why does he allow us to go through adversity? Why does he allow us to go through pain? Because we become blessed when we seek him, when we understand who he is, and we cling to him. We become blessed. Blessed are the poor. Blessed are those who mourn. That's what Jesus taught. Blessed are those who are going to go through the darkest valley, that are going to go through adversity. They will be blessed if they don't trip, they don't fall on their face, and they don't give up on me because of it. They will experience the true blessing that I have for him. Jesus was okay with John going there because he knew what was yet to come for John, and it was good. No matter what you're going through today, and I'm not trying to make light of it. You need to know that if you trust in Jesus Christ, it is true what is coming ahead is good. But in the meantime, in the meantime, all of the New Testament is story after story after story of people who live for Christ going through adversity. Only in a culture that's as blessed as ours do we rip and tear verses out to our pleasure and use them wildly. Philippians 4.13 
I can do all things in Christ who strengthens me. It's an amazing verse, completely used out of context continuously. Just for fun last night, to prove I'm not crazy, I googled it. What comes up is stuff like Tim Tebow, great football player who claims this verse so he can be a successful football player. And look, it's true. God makes him successful. Or John Jones, UFC MMA fighter who claims a verse so he can beat the snot out of the other guy. God gives him victory. He can do all things. We rip these verses out. We use them out of context. The context of that verse is written by Paul in prison, chained to a wall, who says, look, I have learned the secret of contentment even when I'm starving to death. Let me tell you the secret of living a life of contentment when there's nothing left to rejoice for. Here's the secret. You can do it because Christ gives you the strength to be content. That's the context. We take another great verse that I love, Romans 8, 28. And we put on there that God works all things together for the good of those who love him. And so we just assume, oh, well, that must mean then that God's going to take all these things in my life and I'm going to be better off next year. So I'm going to go through hardships, trying, but God's going to make me more prosperous, right? I mean, I'm going to be more wealthy than I was before. Everything's going to be better. And we claim all these verses, but all these verses that we rip out of Scripture, the context of them is about putting our hope in what is yet to come. Hope is in what is not yet seen or known, but it is yet to come. It is true that God works things all good. He brings them together. He will bring them and he will make good come out of them if we persevere. If we do not give up hope, if we stay faithful to him in the meantime, he will take whatever it is in our life and he will eventually bring it to good. He will. The context of that verse is talking to the church about the future glory, about the fact that one day we will see him. One day, we will be out of here. One day, we will experience the full goodness of God. That's the context of the verse. Three verses later, in fact, somewhere it's in my notes. I don't even know where it is anymore. Somewhere it says, for, in verse 31, for today, we are being killed and ravaged and beaten. But one day. In the meantime, we're experiencing things that we don't want to experience, but God is faithful, God is just, God is loving, and God is present, and his promises will not fail. In the meantime, we get to discover what is our faith truly on? What is our faith on? When things happen in our life, you will have people it's sad, but you will have people. They'll tell you if you just believed more, if you had a little more faith, if you could coerce God, he would take you out, take you out of here. He would eject you out of this pain. He doesn't want you to go through pain. He doesn't want you to suffer. He doesn't want you. I want you to know that sometimes that's true. Sometimes God wants to bring himself glory through healing, but he more often than not in scripture as far as I can tell brings himself glory through people who are willing to trust him in the face of adversity in circumstances they do not want to face, but they do not give up. It's, it's, it's the story throughout Scripture. You cannot read this and not see that. Book after book, the church was based on the future. The church was based on the resurrection. When they realized and they recognized that death could not defeat them, they truly believed they were invincible and they went into boldness and preached the good news. They even, what can you do to somebody who believes that they will live forever? And it brought Glory, when you look at what's going on in the world today, God is up to things. Some people look at it and say, God is absent. I say, well, God's got to be doing something. It's going to be great. It's going to be good. 
I know he's building his church. I know he's building faith. He's, he's refining people for sure. He's finding out who trusts him, who's going to depend on him, who won't fall away, who's going to persevere, who's going to go through. He's building himself a people of faith because he's about to do something great, and I believe it is true. If we want God to do great things in our lives, we must expect to go through adversity. Jesus told us to expect it. (laughs) It's in his word. Romans 8, 28 is a great verse. We know that God can take all these things and he can work them for the good of those who love him. You may not want to be where you're at today and you have something going on in your life you wish God would get rid of right now and there's nothing wrong with praying it. There's nothing wrong with questioning what God's up to. But I want you to know that if you're willing to take this brokenness, your broken relationship, your broken health, if you're willing to take the devastation around you and you're willing to say, Jesus, I love you and you can receive glory through this. I will trust you through it. He will use it for the good of people willing to do that. I promise you he will do that. The question that I had to wrestle with, and it's probably the hardest question that I've had pop in my head, so I didn't want to come up with it. Do we really, really, is our faith actually rest? Do we really want to bring God glory. Is that why we follow him? Do you follow Jesus Christ because you want to glorify him or are you following him because you're hoping that he'll make things work out? Because when you go through the meantime, you will trip, you will fall flat, and you will question if he's the one. And then he asked me, Sean, if, if it could bring me glory, would you be willing to go through pain, suffering, hardship, loss of loved ones, sickness? If that would bring me glory, would you do that? Or would you fall away and seek a life of safety and pleasure, materialness, and create your own kingdom? Would you? Be willing, no matter what it was. And that's what Paul said in all of his teachings. Whether I live, whether I die, for you be the glory. You decide, Jesus. Do you want to use this meantime experience? Do you want to use this broken relationship? Do you want to use my brokenness with my kids right now? Do you want to use my health? Do you want to use this for your glory? Then Jesus, I trust you through it. And I want to bring you glory. What do we do in times when we experience these events that happen around us? I think we pray. I think we pray for protection. I think we pray for his presence because it is true that he's the only one that can strengthen you to get through it. It The verse is true. There's nothing wrong with the verse. In Christ, he will give you strength to endure all things. He will strengthen you. And so we pray for his presence. We pray for strength. And then we pray for his purposes. We pray for his glory to be known. There's no point in an entire community getting wiped out by fire if no glory to God comes out of it. There's no, then I don't get it. But we pray that in the midst of ashes, in the midst of ISIS, in the midst of whatever's going on in your life, God Bring your glory out because I don't want to go through this without bringing you glory. You can pray that. And then I would say pray for perspective. Pray to see what he sees so that you can actually join him in what he's doing. We don't sit back and let catastrophes happen and go, oh, God will figure it out. We pray for perspective. We pray for eyes to see that we can join him in what he's already doing. That is what we're called to do. Throw abandonment off and join him in his work. Tell people the hope that we have found when we went through adversity as well. May God help us 
to learn how to pray for these times and also get involved. I want to pray for you today. I know that in a crowd of this size, there's a lot of you going through some, something. And you're in a situation, maybe it's not as bad as losing your entire home, maybe it's worse, maybe it's relational. And you're in the meantime, and you're asking that question, Jesus, I was worshiping you, I've, I've preached about you, I've talked about you, and you're leaving me here. And I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you that you will persevere. I want to pray for you that you will have your faith strengthened and you will be able to bring him glory, that the blessing of God would pour out through this meantime experience. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we think of moms today because it's Mother's Day and we know there's a lot of moms here who ache. Maybe they've lost a child or their children are far from you or their relationship are, is broken. And there's others, there's people who have lost their jobs. There's people who, ever, they're sick, they, 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 they've prayed, they've sought you. There's those that, they can't, they can't do it, actually. Heavenly Father, would you do what we're asking? Would you give them the strength that comes through you? That they would be able to persevere?